So what I, what I thought I'd start off with is just introducing everybody to the Sharia. Um, obviously, um, there's a lot of, a, a lot of apologetics about, about the Sharia. Um, it's actually quite straightforward. It's derived uh, from Islam's most important canonical texts, the Quran itself, and then the Hadith, which are, loose analogy might be the Gospels. I mean, they are the, the, the words, deeds, and even physical gestures of Muhammad as recorded by his earliest followers, the, early, the first Muslims. Um, and then these works were codified and interpreted by Islam's greatest legal scholars. Uh, what's, what becomes problematic about Sharia and what differentiates it from other um, quote-unquote religious laws is that it's not merely holistic in the sense of being all-encompassing. So it, it has ritual aspects, it even regulates hygienic matters. It's, it's extremely political and it, 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 it regulates in a legal sense uh, Muslim minority communities, Islamic states, blocks of states, and even a global order under Islam, uh, under, under the Sharia itself. And this is where it runs afoul, obviously, of, of our conceptions uh, of separation of church and state, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but more specifically, it, it actually includes uh, laws that are antithetical to the foundational freedoms we take for granted in, in the West. So there is no freedom of speech. There is no freedom of conscience. Um, Non-Muslims are relegated almost to a non-legal status. They're outcast pariahs, um, and they are subjugated. Uh, they are subject to a whole series of humiliating uh, regulations, and and um, obviously also inequality, if they are brought to something that would be equivalent to a case of of of, of, of uh, a p penal law, um, and even Muslim women are again relegated to a status that is, is incompatible with modern human rights uh, standards. They're essentially chattel. Uh, um, and uh, Muslims themselves are subjected to punishments that we would consider to be dehumanizing. So um, lashing for alcohol consumption, uh, death for uh, apostasy, uh, stoning to death for adultery, uh, amputation for theft. Um, and what gets confusing to people is that because of the Western colonial em enterprise in so many parts of the Muslim world, with the introduction of British law in part, French law in part, um, Dutch law in part, for example, in Indonesia, a lot of these really draconian regulations were rolled back. But that has nothing to do with a indigenous reform movement within Islam. It has to do with the fact that, that colonial occupying powers held back the full force of the Sharia. So with the period of decolonization, we've now seen the revitalization uh, of the Sharia. And whenever, you know, there's the whole, uh, and the congressman and lots of other people have been subjected, subjected to the quote unquote Islamophobia industry. So pointing out basic facts such as these becomes uh, a an act of bigotry. And what I find very interesting is that one, I, we're all grasping at ways to defend ourselves from charges like this. And I, I like to quote Muslim authorities uh, when, 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 when I am you know, similarly accused of this. And, and actually, this is a very, this is a, a, a very noble man. He was... Um, uh, he's an, he was a former Iraqi MP, but still, if, if you were to look at him, he, he, he wore traditional dress. He, he was, he was, uh, he, he was, he was, uh, um, almost looked like a, a, a typical Shiite, uh, Ayatollah, uh, uh, Jamad al-Din, uh, uh, and he was, he was making the point that he was very concerned about uh, the reintroduction of full-fledged Sharia in Iraq. Iraq, too, was one of these places which went uh, through a period of secularization, Western colonization. The Ba'ath, as awful as they were, were still more secular-leaning. Um, but his concerns were expressed this way, very frankly. Again, this is, a, this is a believing Muslim. What he says is, under the rule of Islam, there is no equality among people. Absolutely not. 
A Muslim is not like a dhimmi. A dhimmi is uh, a non-Muslim, typically Jew or Christian, maybe Zoroastrian too, vanquished by the jihad conquests and, and subjected to the Sharia, again, in such a way that imposes these fundamental discriminations. Um, and then they are given a pact which provides frees them, uh, provides th their life. Their life is spared. Instead of being forced to convert and or killed, they have to, they have to exist in this subjugated status. So he says, um, a Muslim is not like a dhimmi. Uh, the term dhimmi embodies a great deal of scorn and contempt. This is a Muslim speaking. Uh, it, it, is as, it is as if the Christian is saying, quote, I am under your protection, under your thumb. This is what it means. The notion of civic identity is based on equal e equality in duties and rights, but under the rule of Islam, Muslims and non-Muslims are not equal, neither in their duties nor in their rights. Again, so this is a, this is a, this is a, a Shiite Muslim speaking. The late, and then he goes on to say, the late regime of the Taliban in Afghanistan was a pure Sunni Islamic rule. A clear Shiite regime is that of the juris, jurisprudent ruler who claims to be substituting the Prophet Muhammad, and he is Allah upon the earth. More or less, he's describing Iran. He goes on to say, whoever wants the rule of the Sharia should turn to the Taliban government or to the Ayatollah's government in Iran, or else he should select the Western human rights and the notion of liberties. These rights do not exist in Islam. Now, Congressman, if you or I were to say that, we'd be called Islamophobic. This is a pious Muslim uh, admitting. He's not saying, it, now, it, it, Islam has had a very fundamental difficulty with relegating a, a, a true separation between religious and, and, and state. But obviously, this is what this man is yearning for. He's not, he's not, he's not making sort of a, a, a sugar-coated assessment of how likely that is to happen. He's saying these are the choices that, that his people have to make. Uh, uh, in, in Iraq. And I find it very helpful to refer to Muslims, whether they're believers or not. I mean, of course, they're obviously free thinkers in Islam, the way they're in, in Western societies, you know, who also don't want any part of this and obviously want separation of church and state. And I think it, it, it's very helpful to point that out to people that love to spray uh, charges of, of, uh, of, of um, you know, Isl Islamophobia. And actually, you know, when we get back into the realm of, of, of traditionalist Islam, uh, Islamophobia has a whole different context. And here's where you, we can see um, the Muslim Brotherhood operate. The Muslim Brotherhood's emblem, it comes from Quran 8, 860, uh, and it's, it's literally uh, uh, to, to strike terror into the heart of the infidel. That's actually the definition of Islamophobia. In other words, to make, to make the infidel be fearful and, and submit. Now, sometimes making the infidel fearful um, is a way to conquer them without bloodshed. And that's considered to be very, very noble. In our age, it seems to be morphing now into, into the idea of shaming <laughs> um, and getting societies, governments uh, to submit. Um, but but uh, traditionally, and then, of course, we see it with the more violent jihadist groups. Islamophobia is noble. It's, it, we're, we're, we're having trouble defining things. Um, it, you know, they've, <coughs> under, the, under the guise of political correctness, you know, Islamophobia has this other meaning that we're unfortunately familiar with. But, but at the same time, it has a very concrete meaning, which, which is another way of forcing uh, a, a submission. And I think it's, it's, it's important to keep that in mind when we're dealing in these, in these propaganda wars. It, it's not a mistake that the Muslim Brotherhood, which is now the government of Egypt, which is sweeping across the Middle East, um, has, has that verse and that symbol. Uh, there is a level of, of, of wanting, to, um, wanting to invoke uh, uh, fear. The other theme that I develop uh, uh, in the book has to do, again, getting back to this notion of totalitarianism. Um, there, it's interesting because, uh, again, prior to the era of political correctness, it, it was amazing to me to discover a whole series of thinkers across the political spectrum. The two that struck me the most, because they did this so early on, were the, the ardent atheist Bertrand Russell in 1920 and his polar opposite, uh, the Catholic apologist G.K. Chesterton, 
within a year of each other, again, just, just as Bolshevism was emerging as, an, as, a, as a recognizable ideology, they both compared it to Islam. Now, they, they weren't trying to be insulting. They were just trying to restate principles that have to do with despotic uh, uh, systems. Um, and I was able to find as, as recently as, as, the, as the 1950s, um, there was a, apparently, it was in vogue, uh, comedians, when they wanted to make the, uh, an analogy to, to communism, uh, they, would, they came up with this aphorism, which comes from uh, the Muslim profession of faith, where communism was described as, there is no God, and Karl Marx is his prophet. And, and, and people used to be able to, to, to say these things as a matter of, 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 uh, of, of explication. And, and, and we, can't, we can't lose that. And, and, I, and I think, I think, you know, I think the, 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 it's, it's very important uh, to, to be able to, if we are going to get people like this Iraqi MP to emerge and get support, we in, we in the West have to understand that there are, there are, there are fundamental inconsistencies between a, a, a true Sharia-based system and, and certainly our, our own, our own uh, system and what we would aspire for Muslims. Um, and so uh, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of what I think needs to happen now is that, is, is that we have to, we have to um, overcome the fear uh, of, of being falsely accused uh, uh, of being haters because we have familiarized ourselves with these doctrines. We have heard the complaints uh, of, of Muslims who have found a way to live uh, Islam as a, as a private faith. Um, and it, it, if, the, if the institutions in Islam haven't evolved the way these individuals have, uh, they're they're really at a at a tremendous uh, disadvantage. There are there are individuals within Islamic societies uh, that that realize this as things evolved in the West, and actually not only the West. Um, one interesting comparison is to look at look at two places, uh, two parts of the world: um, Israel and its neighbors, who are all under British colonial rule, uh, and then the Indian subcontinent. Um, which of course includes uh, Pakistan and if you extend the borders a little bit into, into Afghanistan. I was struck by an observation by a man who was the greatest uh, scholar of, of Mughal India. So this, this was a period in uh, 16th, uh, 17th, into the 18th centuries. Some of the rulers, the Muslim rulers, particularly Akbar, were, were quite enlightened and tried to actually create a system that was a, a synthesis of Hinduism and, 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 uh, and Islam. And then, of course, there was a reaction to this. Uh, the, the, the orthodox uh, ulima, the orthodox clerics, uh, di didn't, didn't accept this. And, and, and there was a reaction, unfortunately. Akbar had introduced some very basic reforms. He got rid of the system temporarily that discriminated against the Hindus. Uh, he abrogated, it was a remarkable thing to do in the 16th century, he abrogated parts of the Sharia. And, and you know, he had issues with, with his own <laughs> clergy for, for doing this, but it, it at least temporarily improved a lot of the Hindus considerably. What was his theological argument for doing this? He didn't have, he, he was the boss. <laughs> that was his argument. You know, I am the law. You know, that was more or less his argument. And actually, he started out as a pious jihadist. I don't know exactly, you know, what turned him around, love affairs, you know, court intrigue, etc. <laughs> right, it's a woman in Florida. Um, but, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Sarkar, uh, who was a great Indian historian uh, of, of, this, of this entire Mughal period, wrote something very striking, I think it was about 1950, in, in an essay. He wished that the, the, the Arabs uh, under the Sharia surrounding Israel and within historical Palestine and as well as the, 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 the Muslims on the Indian subcontinent would, would look at the example of Israel and what he aspired for India too, at what happens when certainly the most onerous aspects of, of, the, of the Sharia, it doesn't have to be every single aspect of it which tells you, you know, what time to pray or something like that, but the most onerous liberty crushing aspects of the Sharia were, were shaken off. 
that that it was it was an obstacle to the advancement of these societies and it wasn't said in the least bit bigoted way he said he said he said he talked about how how the israelis having abrogated the sharia having been given the institutions by the british didn't get rid of them they had plenty of disputes with the british but they didn't get rid of these western um, institutions that led to representative governments um, little well maybe as socialistic as we're heading now but not 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 in, in that era um, and 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 uh, really uh, uh, embraced uh, a representative system a western based certainly western leaning system he wished that that what became Pakistan and then all Israel's Muslim neighbors would do the same thing. It, 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 it would allow them to thrive in a way that he thought, with all the struggles that take place in Israel and India, had taken place for these people be, because they hadn't rejected everything as out of hand from, from the British system. Um, so, uh, again, in the course of doing this book, I, I came across many such uh, voices, but, but including, in, in, including, including um, uh, so, some Muslim voices. Um, uh, the flip side, and I think the side that, that uh, particularly um, in the whole issue of Muslim Brotherhood infiltration, uh, which, is, which is concerning, um, is that I don't think people understand um, that, unfortunately, institutional Islam in America is very traditionalist, very conservative, very looks, looks to the Middle East, looks to Iran in terms of the Shiite community, um, and sadly is setting up, it, it, it's, not, it's not simply a question of the overt sort of uh, infiltration that the congressman is very familiar with in terms of the Holy Land Foundation. Um, I'm not saying it's dis totally disconnected, but, but in parallel with this are institutions that I discovered like the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. And again, I'm not saying that they don't have ties to some of the you know, MB types. Uh, they do. But they're also operating at a level that's very open. Uh, they, for example, they run, not, they, they, well, first of all, they train uh, imams. They, every year they have a big session for, it's Canada and the U.S., it's, North, it's, it's, it's the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, so they train imams in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and you get an understanding of the nature of this training when you just go to their website and read the fatwas that they issue. When Muslims contact them via the Internet and they want to know about issues like blasphemy, like apostasy, they're given the traditionalist responses. Um, they're told that, uh, and then the question comes up, well, what about waging jihad, including against our host societies? Well, no, but, but it's, it's a postponement. It's not, this is anathema, you cannot do it. Um, and and I, I, I remember when the first King hearings were, were, were going on, and of course the whole you know, reaction, uh, they were McCarthyite, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I felt that at some point in those hearings, I would have just liked to see Congressman King call in the Assembly of Muslim Jurists and the guys who issue specific fatwas, the guy who wrote the blasphemy fatwa, the guy who wrote the apostasy fatwa, the guy who talks about, well, you know, not ready now to wage jihad, female genital mutilation, the lack of uh, uh, there being any status or, or any entity such as marital rape. All these, all these opinions have been rendered. Um, a, I'd like to see just th that the public understood this, but B, I want to see how these imams under questioning rationalize these positions. H how can they be advising uh, uh, Muslims who are writing in for advice uh, in public, in a public forum like this? Um, I want them to, uh, they, should be, they should be questioned. Uh, why, why are they giving this advice? Don't they understand that, that, that this is anathema to, to, the, to the culture, the common culture that we're trying to create here? And then the other issue that came up that I found very alarming, um, not as bad as telling, you know, blasphemers should be killed, et cetera, et cetera, was, uh, uh, if you recall, the whole issue, and we still don't have all the facts because we don't have the video, about, about bin Laden's so-called uh, Sharia-compliant sea burial. Um, who knows what actually happened? Maybe, maybe some people know from, you know, secret testimonies. Um, but 
what it prompted me to look at what the protocols were for for Muslim, patriotic Muslims that are killed in the course of of, of battle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there there should be a mechanism for a anyone who serves in the forces to get the appropriate uh, religious burial. And and again, what I noticed is that the the burial ceremonies for the for the navy and for the for the army, I believe as well, and certainly the marines. Um, included the recitation of the opening verse, uh, uh, the opening, the opening surah. I'm sorry, the opening chapter. It's a very short uh, uh, surah in in the Quran, and the first six verses are kind of nondescript, just sort of generic praises to to uh, Islam and, and 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 Allah. But the seventh verse, which I felt could have been just omitted and should have been omitted but it's repeated at these burial ceremonies, is an eternal curse upon Jews and Christians. And I, first of all, I don't understand why the Muslim chaplains and whoever, you know, obviously advised on this, on this ceremony had to include that verse. But it just struck me as, as how, could this be, how could this be said at a burial ceremony where, you know, it's going to be mostly non-Muslims in attendance. And, 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 and just to prune that out. Uh, for, I think the initiative should have come, in fact, from, from Muslim chaplains. This is always, this is, well, there's a whole body of jurisprudence that has now <laughs> evolved, actually. Um, it's, it has ancient roots, but, but it, it, it's, it's really been refined in the last 30, 40 years via the Muslim Brotherhood, via, unfortunately, Congressman, um, uh, one of the avatars of this, uh, it's called the jurisprudence for the minority. So it's, tar it's targeting Muslim communities in the West, in the United States, in, in, in Western Europe. Um, it's basically giving uh, people who truly are Sharia supremacists in the long view um, flexibility when they can't impose the Sharia. It's just physically impossible. Uh, it's allowing them to make all kinds of, of, of concessions to the letter of, of, the, of, of, of the law, of the Islamic law, uh, until uh, the opportunities uh, afford themselves. And unfortunately, one of the big proponents of this idea, of this, of this new, quote unquote, jurisprudence, um, is, the, is the Institute of Muslim Minority Affairs which is where uh, 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 the Abedin family, that's the journal that they've run since the late uh, uh, 1970s. And, um, and Huma was, uh, was an editorial assistant with the journal uh, for 12 years, actually right up until she, she uh, you know, joined uh, Hillary Clinton's staff. You and say that is the journal that they've run what, what do you mean that? Uh, the, the Journal of Muslim Minority Affairs is part of the Institute of Muslim <coughs> Minority Affairs, um, which is um, uh, Saudi, Wahhabi-funded, uh, MB-related uh, uh, publication, which does actually, it, again, here's where the analogies to communism come in again. You'll notice when I, I went through years and years of, of the articles that they published there, either in abstract or in some cases, Christine was kind enough to purchase a lot of them for me, and, and, I, and I read through them. Um, sometimes they'll deal with issues that are very esoteric and, and academic, which is a lot of uh, Communist Front journals did that too for many, many years in foreign policy. Um, but other times, and one, at the time that, that, that uh, Christine first got me uh, some major articles, it was, it was the current issue back in May, which I read cover to cover. And one, one essay was an upfront endorsement of this minority jurisprudence, which gives all kinds of flexibilities with the ultimate goal, goal of imposing full-fledged Syria. That was right in the journal. It makes it clear that's the ultimate goal. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and the, other, the other article that jumped that out at me. after Huma was taken off the, uh, the, the, the oh, 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 yes, yes. That's that's right. That's right. That's right. No, absolutely. You're ab you're absolutely right. Um, and then the other the other uh, uh, article that jumped out at me was was a um, a celebration uh, of of the leading uh, sub two of the leading 20th century uh, ideologues uh, that share the Muslim Brotherhood worldview. Uh, this uh, and were and were foundational members of the of the Muslim World League. 
um, uh, Maududi himself, uh, Abdul uh, uh, Maududi, the Indian uh, jihadist, um, and uh, 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 this other, this other, uh, well, Karadawi was another one, um, and and another Indian Muslim, uh, Nadwi. The, these were the ideologues that were being championed unabashedly in, in the current issue then, in May of this year, uh, of, of, the, um, uh, of the Journal of Muslim uh, Minority Affairs. Um, so it's, 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 it's kind of uh, hiding in plain sight uh, at, at a certain level. Didn't Karadawi just write a book about this minority? Yes, uh, yes. He, he and, and another guy, I'm sorry, the other guy that, that, I, that I omitted about this minority jurisprudence is the head of the Institute of Islamic Thought uh, based in Virginia, isn't it? Uh, um, yeah, that, that was, um, I'm blanking on his name, um, and he, uh, 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 he, he also was a big champion of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Alawani, uh, Alawani, yeah. Um, so so these, were, these were the ideologues that were being championed in the May issue uh, of, the, of the Journal of Muslim M Minority Affairs. Unlike Christianity and Judaism, there is no recognized school of moderate or modern Islam. To what extent is that absence, that lack, part it, of the... It, I think that, uh, I, I would clarify just a little bit, I think the historical processes have, have been uh, a little different. I mean, well, a little, actually profoundly different, but, but um, there, there's really not uh, a, a, Islam didn't go through a championing of the individual, uh, which the Renaissance, that was already happening. I know Christine knows this from her lit background. That was already happening in the West. It certainly, it's, it's had reformation after reformation after reformation. We're living probably through one now, but it's never had an enlightenment. Um, and, and so, you know, when you, when you look at the, at the institutions, they really are ossified in this medieval fortress. Uh, one, one example that I like to give that brings it home, and actually developed this more in, in, my, in my last book, In the Legacy of Islamic Antisemitism, is to look at the career trajectory of the late grand imam of Al-Azhar University, who died suddenly from a myocardial infarction from a heart attack in, 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 in March of 2010, uh, Muhammad Sayyid Tantawi. Tantawi served as what would be the uh, equivalent to the, to the Pope, the papal equivalent. So the Grand Imam of Al Azhar University from 1996 till he suddenly died in March of, of 2010. What set him on his career path uh, is something that I provided uh, an enormous amount of, 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 of extracts in translation because I, I was just shocked when I had a, an Arabic scholar friend translate big sections of this work for me. In the late 60s, his magnum opus, and it was republished several times, I think the last version came out in 86, but in the late 60s, his magnum opus was, it translates into Jews in the Quran and the traditions. So in, in the Quran and, and the Hadith and early biographies of Muhammad, etc. It's a 700 page treatise which, which uh, demonstrates and celebrates for all time the most profoundly anti-Semitic motifs in Islam's canon. And doesn't just talk of them in a historical sense or, or in a doctrinal sense. It talks about them as a, as a living uh, ideology. And I thought to myself, as you see him eventually become the grand imam, imagine if, if then Cardinal Ratzinger, life work was to recapitulate um, the, the worst elements of medieval uh, Christian uh, 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 anti-Semitic tracts, li literally. And that somehow was his key to becoming the Pope. It just, it, it would be unheard of. And it really brought home to me that, you know, we're dealing with a very, very different situation. Uh, when it comes to institutional uh, Islam. It doesn't mean that all Muslims buy into um, uh, even Tantawi's theology, but it does tell you that it represents the mainstream. Al-Azhar is the most respected Sunni religious teaching institution in the world, and it has been since it was founded in 973. So it's not a fly-by-night 
uh, issue if a man of this stature, oh, and by the way, he was interviewed, so he comes out, so the last edition was published in 1986. So right after he has, a, uh, he actually, it was, it was a, actually it was a good sign, he sat down with the ch chief rabbi of Israel in, in, in Egypt in, in late 1997. But he was interviewed after that meeting and he said, no, he said, the reason I met with him, because he was criticized by, by some even more conservative than him, why did you meet, you know, with this representative of the Zionist entity? Uh, and, uh, and, and he said, you know, because in theological debates I wanted to stick a finger uh, in his eye. Um, and, and he said, and I still believe everything that I wrote in my, in my Ph.D. thesis, you know, which is this anti-Semitic uh, magnum uh, opus, and he would go on to sanction homicide bombings not only against Israelis, but also initially at least, he sort of went back a little bit, against our troops during the, fir der during the uh, initial stages of the campaign in Iraq. I mean, this is the grand, this is the grand imam of Al-Azhar uh, University. Andy, what's I, so much I, I, I think, again, I think we have to, we have to be more confident in, 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 what, in what we want Americans to be. Um, in, in, in terms of, of true uh, 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 adherence to, to the Constitution and, and the liberties that, 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 that make us who we are. Um, and I think we have to talk honestly. I have, we have to do the opposite of, what's, of, what, of what our political leaders in many cases are imposing on us, which is, which is not acknowledging what this body of, of law is all about saying that, again, it, it has nothing to do with, with, uh, with, with uh, the ritual aspects that involve uh, cleanliness, uh, uh, um, that, that involve times of prayer, et cetera, et cetera. It has to do with, with, the, with the inability, at least till now, of Muslim societies and Muslims in the diaspora to separate these unacceptable political aspects from from the from the from the benign rituals, and we have to we we just have to make a stand that that's not going to be accepted, and that and that um, if there's going to be some even even issues of family law, you know uh, in 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 we've seen some of these experiments get underway in Europe, and invariably what happens with 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 the family law aspects in Britain and Germany, um, are that or that. Um, you know, so, so that it's not a question of of of, uh, of of giving an imprimatur to waging jihad, but but it is giving an imprimatur to discrimination against Muslim women in, in in some of these instances, and we have to take a stand on that. I think any time it runs afoul of our constitutional principles, we have to say no, no. It, uh, there was even an issue as a physician that came up, that this is how it gets. That, it was thought that, well, because it's too judgmental to talk about female genital mutilation, so why don't we come up with a... This is the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank God it was ultimately rejected. They said, well, you know, they do do this thing in Indonesia, and which, which it's not working in Indonesia either, um, where they, they call it, sorry to be so blunt about it, clitoral nicking. And I... What are you talking about? Because, because the fear was if you didn't let them nick the clitoris, they might take the whole thing off. And, and, and this was actually, yes, Lou, this was actually presented to the American Academy of Pediatrics. But, you know, rational people said this is an outrage. But it, was, it, it got to the point of actually being considered.